Myself, as a geneticist and genomicist, I'm interested in the landscape of DNA, trying to understand patterns and processes that actually make us who we are. So, as a genomicist, these days are awesome. You know, we're in the middle of a genomics revolution. Sequencing is cheap, easy, and quick. Why is that? Because we've got a whole bunch of new sequencing te technologies. In the last 10 years, we have around six that are now in, in the public domain. These sequencing technologies are generating tons of data that are now smashing Moore's law. Uh, hopefully by the end of this year, and I predict probably by the end of this year, every one of you can sequence your full genome for less than a thousand bucks. And then the other thing is we're changing our paradigm from looking at biology from a genetics point of view to a genomics point of view. And this is really important because it takes us from looking at genes to the full scope of the genome. But one of the biggest challenges is that we don't know much about the genome. The functional importance of the vast majority of DNA is unknown. So right here we have a small little gene. It's transcribing an R mRNA. But around it is vast unknownness. We don't know what's going on there. So just to put this into context, for a vertebrate genome, less than 3% of that genome actually codes for a protein. And the vast majority of it, around 97% of it, is non-coding. In the last few years, we actually think that that non-coding DNA actually does matter. We call this dark matter. This is the dark matter of the genome. And this is one of the main challenges that most of us genomicists have to, have to work on for the next few years. And we just really need a lot more people to work on this problem. But the good news is that we actually cracked the code. We cracked the genetic code over 50 years ago. And these three individuals, Nuremberg, Karana, and Hawley, they actually received the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1968 uh, for doing exactly that, cracking the genetic code. But this is only for 3% of the genome. But still, we know a lot about the genome. So I'm an explorer. I explore the lands that are found within the cells. This is what we call the genome. The genomes are found in chromosomes. Once you unravel the chromosomes, you'll get this long strand of DNA, DNA being A, T, Cs, and Gs. And this is what we call the genotype. So the central dogma of molecular biology was a term that was brought out by Francis Crick in the early 70s. And his idea was that if we know the genotype, we can understand the phenotype. The phenotype being physical characteristics or traits of an individual. So here we have genes. And those genes can transfer in themselves. We can translate that knowledge of genes. We could basically decode our genome and find out what proteins are actually made. And this is very important for the rest of this talk. So when I think of genetics, I think of genetics as a way that we could understand how DNA flows from, um, how information flows from DNA to messenger RNA and then translated to amino acids or protein. So here we have a DNA molecule, and the prediction eventually is that once we understand the code, the full extent of the code, don't forget, there's three billion base pairs in every single one of our cells. How many cells do we have? Can anyone guess? Anyone? Trillions of cells in our body. So imagine that, three billion base pairs multiplied by two because we got mom and dad, multiplied, multiplied by trillions of cells. It's pretty amazing. Um, and once we understand every one of those three billion base pairs, we could actually figure out what makes people who they, do, who they are and why they do uh, what they do. So this is John Cage, and he's an inspiration for our project, our genome music project, and you'll hear this later on. So DNA in protein coding regions can be actually translated as three base pairs equal a codon. So here we have a linear array of DNA, and every three basically form a codon. In each codon, we have a first position, a second position, and a third position, and that's going to be important for later on. And each codon codes for an amino acid. So once we have these codons coding for these amino acids, these, am these amino acids actually get up together and they form a protein. So let's do the math, a really, really simple math question. If we have three nucleotide positions and there's four base pairs, A, T, C, Gs, and Ts, um, how many different codons are there? There's 64. So we have 64 potential codons, and they code for 21 amino acids. So this means that we actually have a redundant or degenerate genetic code. What does that mean? Well, here is an example. This is proline. It's an amino acid. And that amino acid actually has four different codons. And what's important for this talk is that it's the third position of those codons that can change, and it'll still remain the same amino acid. So um, a few years ago, 
myself and a, a couple colleagues, um, Manolis Keltz from MIT and Bill Gelbart at Harvard University, we, um, we decided that we wanted to use an evolutionary approach to identify gene regions. So to do that, we're using codon ideas. Um, so the third position of the codon is the one that actually wobbles. What wobble means is that if you change that base pair, it doesn't change the amino acid. In other words, it's neutral. So if you change that third base pair in each codon, for the most part, it doesn't change the amino acid. So just to give you an evolutionary uh, rundown, here we have Darwin and we have a chimpanzee. Over five to seven million years ago, they actually had a common ancestor. That common ancestor is, can be denoted in this nine base pair event. So this is a sequence. I separated them out because this is protein coding region. These are three codons. And in the human lineage, we had a mutation. Mutations happen. That's what happens in evolution over time. But the cool thing is that these mutations usually happen, if it's in a protein coding region, happens at the silent site. It doesn't change the amino acid and then the protein. In the chimp lineage, we also had a mutational event. That mutation took place, again, at the third position of another codon. So as evolutionary biologists, whenever we see sequences, the first thing we do is we run to the computer and we align them. And that's exactly what we can do. In this case here, we have two substitutions. What's interesting, though, is these substitutions take place at the third position of each codon. So now, if we scan the genome for this type of pattern, the pattern being if there are codon or if there's substitution events that take place in multiple of threes, we might be able to infer that that's a genetic region of interest. That is a protein coding region of interest. And that's exactly what we did. So with the greater number of species sampled, we could actually get a stronger, more periodic signal. So here we have those two species, man and chimp, and we have those two substitutions. I extended uh, the codon so that we have one more, one more codon preceding and another codon um, afterwards. Let's add a few more species. So the first species that we added could be, a, it's a sea urchin. It's actually, um, it's a purple urchin. In this case here, we added um, a new mutation, and that mutation was evolved in that sea urchin lineage. So now we have three spots. So the question is, is this a gene region? Well, we might need to get some more species to answer that question. To do that, we added C. elegans and Drosophila melanogaster. These are two model organisms that have been used in laboratories for many decades, Drosophila for more than a century. And what you find here are one, two, three, four. These four mutations happen independently in each event, in each lineage. But what you see when you do the alignment is that these these mutations happen in multiples of threes. This gives us an indication that this region actually codes for a protein, which is pretty amazing. So we could scan tons of genomes. We could scan immense blocks of the genome, and we could find regions that actually code for protein using this technology. So the cool thing is that we could actually hear this as well. We see this on the alignments, but now we can also hear this. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to play, at least Theo is going to play, this simple sequence, melanogaster, it's um, a protein coding sequence. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight codons. Times that by three, it's 24 nucleotides. So let's play. So what he's doing is he's, every single note, if it's an A, he plays the A note. If it's a cytosine, he'll play the C note. If it's a guanine, which is a G, he'll play the G note. If it's a T, he'll play the D. Why? Because there's no, there's no T on the keyboard. So it's a very simple, simple pattern. Now, just to make things a bit more interesting, we're going to get Carl to play on the kick drum, the first codon, the first position of the codon. One, two, three, one, two, three, there we go. So, obviously, there's no signal. We can't actually extract whether there is a gene in this region. The only way that we could do this is by bringing evolutionary knowledge into this. So, let's add another species. Now, in this case here, Carl's going to hit the snare drum every time this is a diverged site. Anytime you see this red, we got a diverged site. There we go, Carl. Not enough information. We still don't have enough signal to know that this is a gene or not. So let's add a few more species. In fact, let's add five more Drosophila species. This represents 50 million years of evolutionary signal. 
Great, so there's some signal right there, and that signal is basically... So we're basically playing 10 species of Drosophila, we're going through 100 million years of evolutionary signal, and we're actually finding a signal. That signal is found in diverged sites that are, for the most part, found in multiples of three away from each other. So that might tell us that there is a gene. So if you don't believe me, if you don't believe that we could actually gain signal from this region versus a non-coding region, let's, let's do that experiment. So let's start off with the coding region again. We're going to actually play the coding region that we played earlier before, but this time we're going to add something a bit more crazy. We're going to add non-coding regions. There's no codons that are uh, attributed to this because it's non-coding. It doesn't code for any protein. So in this case here, Theo is going to play the non-coding and the protein coding. So let's play. Remember, we're just setting you up for the next big thing. The next big thing is our musical premiere of the BRCA1 gene. So you probably heard about the BRCA1 gene. The BRCA1 gene is a breast cancer gene. And if you are a woman and you have BRCA1, a specific variant of BRCA1, there's a huge chance that you'll have breast cancer. You probably heard about this gene in the news this week. So Myriad Genetics holds the patent to this gene. And they're now at the Supreme Court against other groups such as the ACLU who don't believe that corporations or companies can actually patent genes. So what we're going to do today is something completely subversive. And we hope that you don't mind because you might be doing something illegal by listening to this music. <laughs> so we're going to play the BRCA1 gene, at least a portion of it. And it's going to be interpreted using 35 vertebrate genomes. So not the 10 Drosophila genomes, but 35 vertebrate genomes. And in this case here, we're going to do something interesting. I'm going to get off stage and let the guys take care of the music. And we're going to layer things one at a time. The first time we're going to play it, it's going to be Theo. He's going to play a human voice. In fact, it's his own voice. He translated his voice to A, G, Cs, and Ds. And then we're going to layer on the great apes. Then we're going to layer on the new and world old world monkeys. Well, a few more layers of, um, I believe we're going to do some uh, undulates as well as some marsupials. And finally, we're going to bring some birds. So this is going to represent over 300, maybe 350 million years of evolutionary signal. So take it away, guys. A T G C A A A C A G T T A T A A T T T T G C A A A A A A G G A A A A T A A C T C T C C T G A A C A T C T A A A A G A T G A A G T T T C T A T C A T C C A A A G T A T G G G C T A C A G A A A C C A T G
So at the peak of that performance, we had 35 vertebrate species encompassing over 300, 350 million years of evolution. And you could hear the rich genetic diversity in it. And if you notice, we've been simulating what happens when you drop off these species one by one, one group by one group. And it's kind of sad because that's what's happening today right now. Um, a lot of species are actually going extinct. In fact, they've estimated that the species goes extinct every 20 minutes. And a lot of it has to do with our human, uh, human signatures. Wars, overpopulation, deforestation, all these other reasons why we're actually losing species. And at one point, it's just going to be way too late. And at that time, we won't be able to replay the symphony of life as we know it. Thank you.